In the name of God, ground, word, life. Amen. In their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. A blessed third Sunday of Easter to you all. Again, here we are from, from Hinkley Ridge on a Sunday morning. At least five of us. This is a time of grand transition. And transitions, especially big ones, are so often in fits and starts, right? The daffodils are up. The spinach starts have set their first true leaves. I, I've seen uh, pink on people's cheeks from the sun this past week, and some of us woke up to snow on the ground yesterday. I know it's Maine, but still. Vaccines are flown into arms. I've got my second shot this week, it looks like. Uh, a lot of businesses and schools are reopening. I had coffee outside with someone outside of my immediate household twice. Um, distance and mass and all that good stuff, too, but twice I've done that. And infection rates here in Maine are rising and among younger and younger people as the variants gain footholds. We're transitioning to having a government that actually functions as a government ought to function, you know, making our lives better through collective action. And that transition is going about as smoothly as anyone could expect. We're also in a time of transition here at St. Francis, right? Assuming things don't get worse pandemic wise on Whit Sunday, Pentecost, May 23rd, we will open the doors here on Hinkley Ridge to a lot more of us here. But between now and then, goodness, we have some work to do. We had some technical difficulties last week. I'm sorry, we are working hard to make things as seamless as possible. But this transition, going from just me and Wendy and the girls in Bill's garage, you know, to, to now being here at church with a couple of people and having help doing it and learning how to divide up the labor. And, and then that's only for a few weeks before folks come back to church and then it changes again. I won't be talking to a camera with a few people here. I'll be talking to a few people here, a bunch of people here with a camera. Woo, I gotta talk to Colbert. Maybe he'd tell me how to do this. But at this point, you know, at that point we'll need to do it a different way and our technology here is vastly improved, but it's still far from flawless. We are completely committed to making both the continuing at home practice of worship and the transition back to in person worship as smooth and God willing edifying as possible. And to do that, we do need two things from you all. I'm sure more than two, but these are the two important ones. We need honest feedback. If there are problems, please let us know. Um, and the flip side of that is we need your patience. Um, and if you ever dreamed of being a TV engineer, directing cameras and making sure the show goes on, I have got an opportunity for you. Because today is the 57th time that we have gathered on a Sunday morning like this. 57 times we've celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ like this. 57. There's a lot of Sundays together this way. I'm, I'm amazed that it has gone as well as it has. Now, back in October, on the occasion of our 32nd Sunday online, I, I preached on spiritual communion and what the, the, the real presence of Jesus Christ in the sacrament means to those of us subjected by necessity to virtual worship. And in that sermon, I referenced uh, the Reverend Dr. Ruth Myers. Uh, she's the Episcopal Church's premier or most, most well-known uh, liturgical theologian right now. And she's, she's good. She, she's good. She's very good. Um, and, and she wrote of the Eucharist in, in physically distant times. She said, we glimpse Christ's presence, getting a taste of the heavenly banquet. Yet on this side of the grave, we never experienced the fullness of that presence. Real absence draws us forward to the time when we shall see God face to face. Real absence makes room for the mystery of God whose presence we can neither compel nor control. Well, 25 weeks and six liturgical seasons later, here we are, still at it, at it. You know, real absence is still happening. But now we are in the process of transitioning away from that real absence and back towards the more real presence of not only Jesus Christ and the actual elements of the Eucharist, 
but in consecrating them together, in being the body of Christ together as we have been accustomed to for the 11 or 35 or 74 or 86 or however many other years that you have been here in a church. I'm thinking about all of this. A lot of us are thinking about this a lot, thinking about cameras and video technology and, and, and shot glass communion and hand washing stations and requiring vaccines and seating charts and how to deal with hymns and Sunday school and how to communicate this to everyone. The vestry, the regathering committee, the altar guild, ushers, musicians, parents, property committee, flower guild, everyone who has a job here at the, at, uh, at the church is at hard at work problem solving and experimenting with how to bring us all home. That's everyone except the coffee hour folks. I'm sorry, Mary and Suzanne and the rest of you. That is on hold for the time being. I'm talking about all of this today because first you need to know what's going on, right? A lot of people uh, you go to church with are getting busier and busier in all of this. And, and if you are interested, inspired or simply able, we need technologically competent helpers, as I said below, and all kinds of helpers. We need ushers. We need greeters to guide us through seating and Eucharist. We need the altar guild is on new footing. And with all those shot glasses, that's a lot of scrubbing, right? You know, we, they always need help, as do our Eucharistic minister and lecture ministries, our ministries to families with, and youth and children, particularly, particularly if you have any outdoor activity or outdoor education kind of experience, we've got some ideas in that world. This regathering process takes all of us. The second reason that this is on the front of my prayers today is, is that the reading from St. Luke's Gospel today really got me thinking. They were also in a time of this great transition, the disciples, and, and one far more earth-shattering than what we face. The rabbi, master, Lord, God was dead in front of their eyes, you know, betrayed by one of their own, who, depending on the telling, came to a gruesome end of his own. They were scattered. They were on the run, and, and, and these weird things were happening. Mary Magdalene, and again, depending on the telling, others saw strange things at the grave. Last week, we heard the story of, of Jesus' second appearance behind the locked door, the one for St. Thomas's benefit, right? And directly preceding today's pericope, there are the events on the road to Emmaus and, and the stranger who is revealed to be Jesus himself. And, and then, then this story begins, you know, the, the men who are on the Emmaus road that Jesus had been talking to was telling others what they had seen. And then Jesus appeared to them all. A lot is going on. I mean, salvation, you know, making meaning of the salvation of the world was just beginning. And what sticks out to me in this story from, from the turn in the narrative, from the passion to the presence, to the real presence of Jesus Christ raised from the dead is, is one verse, one half verse, actually. Luke 24, 40, A. In their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. In their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. I mean, if I had a memory verse for this Easter tide, I think that would be it. I am overjoyed with the wind down of the pandemic, the rapidity with which the vaccines are being administered, the, the discipline of the people, at least here in Maine, and keeping up with precautions and, and the functioning of our government across the board. It's amazing. The, the website to get a shot in, in Maine, like it worked so well, like amazingly well. You know? I, I, I'm overjoyed at the anticipation of getting to know you all in person. This will be our second first summer in Maine. It's going to be great. Overjoyed at that anticipation of celebrating mass at a table together, like for real together. Not that what we're doing doesn't count, but like our story today, Jesus actually eating a piece of fish, you know, embodiment, real, realness does matter. And disbelief and still wondering. I believe, yes, and I need help with my disbelief, that, that, that we can do this, and safely, all of this, right? That, that no one will be left behind as we pivot churchward, right? That it's worthwhile, that, that all the effort, all the resources that we can gather together is worth it all. And 
there are larger darknesses I am wrestling with, you know, ones that I know some of you are too, maybe most Episcopalians do, although most are reticent to discuss it with their priest, I get it. That's about our faith. Where is your faith in this moment? Uh, a commentator I, I really appreciate um, uh, had a tornado touch down right you know, 25 feet behind his church office. He's in Tennessee. Um, he was okay and the church was fine. There was damage in the town, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it, it, was, it was bad. It was bad in the town. But, but I so identified him with, 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 when he told this little story, uh, he said, someone asked me, Brother John, were you seeking the Lord when that tornado touched down? And he said, to be honest, I was seeking shelter. Has your faith served you these past 57 weeks? Think of that for a second. How has your understanding, your relationship with God in Christ helped you this past year, these 14 months, this, this dark night of our collective souls in the pandemic, the racial unrest, the economic ruin, police violence, mass shootings, insurrection? Where is your life of faith in all of this? By way of full disclosure, I have to think long and hard about that question. It's been a hard time for my faith this past year, for my relationship with God. I know what I think about things, but I'm not always sure what I believe, what I trust, that is accept into my heart the, the hows and whys of the way things are or ought to be. My feel, faith feels murky at times, especially I am finding in these hard times. You know, why do so many bad things happen to so many good people and so often? Why a pandemic? Why do black men keep getting killed by public servants who should be protecting them? Why are mass shootings happening again? Why are people believing things that are unbelievable? It is for many a hard time to be a believer about the important things. Now I can say without a doubt that the practice of my faith not only continues and is fruitful, but it has saved me. I have no doubt about that. And we've been doing morning prayer four days a week since, I don't know, June. That's like 140 times so far, at least. You know, when, when with the same small group of people, you know, that has saved me. 845, Wednesday through Saturdays, all are welcome at the same Zoom. It's fantastic. You know, our classes, you know, Sacred Ground, our, our, the contemplative prayer class we just had, uh, the Benedictine spirituality we did last year, the catechism that has fed my mind, yes, and gotten to know people, yes, but, but it has bound me to you and God in Christ with the Holy Spirit. Being here with you each Sunday, as odd and stressful as it can be, has given me a reason to engage, has buoyed my spirits with warm, familiar words, has rooted me with common prayer in the fertile soil of God in Christ, even in this time of real absence. My brain, I must say that the ego me has not been suckered by God and faith in the way that it has been in less difficult times. You know, I, I, I'm one who thought myself into faith or at least I had to remove some intellectual barriers before I could relax into Christianity. And that's not holding up as well as I had hoped, but I must say my heart is in it like it's never been before. Like our spiritual ancestors way back at the very beginning of our tradition, I am still wondering. I know lots of you are. In my heart, my spirit is open like so many of yours, wondering, still wondering. My heart, my spirit is open wondering, wonder and joy in this heartbreaking season of mortality. And now in this transition from a time of real absence to a time of real and abiding presence. You might be filled with doubts, but what did Freddie Beekner say that uh, doubts are the ants in the pants of faith, right? Things that used to make sense before the world was turned upside down might not make sense anymore to you. And there might be joy, oddly, seeping in through the suffering that is rampant now and confusion, and wondering. You know, all the things the disciples felt as their world tumbled out of control. If that is where you have been, if the substance of your belief is unknown or wobbly, or if upon thinking about it, that is where you find yourself now, may God bless you and keep you. 
you are not alone. You're actually in the great company, the, in great company, in the company of the very first saints of our faith. This, like then, is a confusing time. So as we finish up these last months of isolation, as we prepare to transition into the next manifestation of the body of Christ in Blue Hill, as we strive to make meaning of the world and our place in it and discern where the world's needs meet our gifts, be gentle with yourself and those around you. And when your thoughts go dark or just blank, remember that the light of Christ in your heart burns and burns brighter the darker things get. I'll end today with the prayer I ended with on our 32nd week together in remote worship. It's by Thomas Merton in it. It stands. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope that I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen. And amen.